Well, thank you very much. Um, Good morning. Welcome to what I am confident is going to be the highlight of the Reagan National Defense Forum in 2023. I'm putting that out there, so it's got to be true now. All the pressure is on our panel. Um, as you heard from our voice of God here, this is uh, overlooking Monroe, protecting the hemisphere and the homeland. Of course, Monroe is referring to the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. And just to geek out for a second here, I'm sure the amazingly smart people at Reagan knew this, but today is actually the 200th, 200th anniversary of the signing or of the announcement of the Monroe Doctrine. It was um, December 2nd, 1823. And I think it's super cool that we get to sit here today and talk about it. It was, of course, when President James Monroe announced it in his annual message to Congress. And it, is, it was a declaration that foreign powers could not become involved in the affairs of independent countries in the Western Hemisphere. And at the time, of course, it was directed at European powers, but the threat has shifted in 200 years. So we have a terrific panel here today to address this and other things in the hemisphere. I, I have my order wrong, so let's see. We have Congressman Mike Waltz. He's a Republican member of the House of Representatives from Florida. He's also a retired colonel in the National Guard and the first Green Beret elected to Congress. General Laura Richardson has been the commander of U.S. Southern Command for just over two years, I believe. Um, and also important to our topic today, she was the commanding general of U.S. Army North, which is the service component command for um, U.S. Northern Command. We have General Paul Nakasone, the commander of U.S. Cyber Command, the director of the National Security Agency, and Central Security Service Chief. I hope you get paid extra for three roles. I'm just saying. <laughs> My, I've got an agent. I can put you in touch with. We'll get you some extra on that. Um, and then we have Joseph Lonsdale. He's a serial entrepreneur uh, and one of the co-founders of Palantir, and he now runs 8VC, which is a venture capital firm. So welcome all. Um, I want to start with the... Well, this is a big topic, right? So let's start with a big question. What do you see as the biggest threat to the Western Hemisphere and to the U.S. homeland right now? And I'm just going to go right down the line, starting with Congressman Waltz. Well, I'd have to say, I mean, right now in the present, um, it's, the, it's the cartels that have essentially taken operational control of our southern border. And uh, according to a number of estimates, control anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of Mexican territory. So if we're looking at more Americans dying each year than we lost in Vietnam in 10 years uh, through fentanyl and, and other uh, types of illicit narcotics that are coming across, one, two, that these organizations are essentially paramilitary transnational crime organizations. They're not like the mafia. They're much more like ISIS, and we need to start treating them that way. Uh, when the Mexican army, the Mexican military, is fought to a standstill, with armored vehicles, heavy weapons, their aircraft shot down when they try to go arrest a cartel member, uh, that is a that is a existential issue uh, that is literally right on our border. So Representative Dan Crenshaw and I have produced have proposed legislation to authorize the use of military force. I have to say, with a strong caveat, no one is talking about invading Mexico. Uh, we are talking about our overwhelmed law enforcement, Customs and Border Patrol, and others that do not have access to assets like General Nakasone has in terms of offensive cyber, space, drones, uh, and other types of methodologies. But the bottom line, Courtney, is we need to unleash uh, military resources to take on what is now a national security problem. If you change the name, from Jalisco and Sinaloa to ISIS and Al-Qaeda, I don't even think we would be, frankly, having this debate. That's the shift we went from the 90s to the 2000s. I think that's the shift that we need to see uh, now. Again, it's an authorization, but I think it will push uh, very scarce resources towards this problem set. And we know how to take down networks. Um, we've been doing it all over the world. We've done it in Colombia. We can do it in Mexico as well. General Richardson. So I would say the, uh, uh, for the Department of Defense, our number one pacing challenge is the People's Republic of China. And so that's at the top of, uh, of our list. Um, but make no mistakes that uh, for our partner nations in the, in the uh, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean, uh, transnational criminal organizations are the, at the top of their list of what they face every day. And I look at the uh, instability and insecurity that they stir up and plow the ground. I mean, they've become way more powerful uh, diversified their portfolio. It's not just uh, trafficking of drugs, it's humans, it's illegal mining, illegal logging, illegal fishing. I mean, it's the whole portfolio. 
and a $300 billion uh, revenue business uh, annually. Very powerful, but then it's also uh, what we've got to do better at is following the money, us from Team USA and our interagency and following that money of how that money is laundered, cleaned, and then put right back into that, that uh, very powerful system. Uh, but uh, in terms of the People's Republic of China, I think through the Belt and Road Initiative is how they uh, bring their authoritarian model uh, under the disguise of a, develop, a developmental model into the hemisphere. And, uh, and that's how they bring their instruments of national power together under this communist government and why they're, why they're so effective, uh, looking like it's investment uh, economically when really it's a lot of extraction at the end of the day. So, Courtney, first of all, thanks for allowing us to be part of the best panel at Reagan. Fantastic. You're welcome. Um, I would say that uh, to, to, to really uh, reinforce both the Congressman and, and General Richardson's point, the near-term threat for us, I think, is transnational criminal organizations. We lose 100,000 people in our nation every year to drugs such as fentanyl. Uh, and as we think about what we need to be able to do to impact that, the near-term impact for me is the reauthorization of 702 to be able to ensure that we have the identi identified intelligence that can lead us to uh, the types of, uh, types of mitigations that prevent that type of precursor and that type of uh, chemical en entering our, our nation. But the longer-term threat truly is uh, the corrosive influence of both China and, I would say, Russia. You know, think about the diplomatic information, military, economic influences that both nations are having in our southern, uh, you know, our southern uh, border and certainly in the, the hemisphere. If we think about it, you know, our national security, our national prosperity, our national identity, I think is tied very, very closely to this region, and sometimes we forget that. Uh, and I think this is an opportunity, certainly today, as we talk about it, to, to remind ourselves just how important that region of the world is to the United States. And just, uh, this is a super smart audience here, but Section 702 of FISA, can you just explain what that right. means? Right, Section 702 of FISA. it expires this month, right, I believe? It expires or? on the 31st, which provides the ability for the U.S. Uh, government to collect information on foreign intelligence targets operating outside the United States that utilize U.S. communication systems such as email and telephone. A critical capability that allows us to be able to ensure the protection of the United States, uh, provide insight to our policymakers, and support military operations. Okay. Mr. Lonsdale. Well, thanks, Courtney. I'm honored to be up here with, with, with these amazing leaders. You know, from my point of view, unfortunately, we really really lack leadership from the top in our country to acknowledge these two threats and what they needs to be done. Basically, the border should be a military issue. We have some of the best and brightest in our country running our military. We have capabilities that would be able to secure our border if we treated it like a serious defense issue, and we have not. The transnational criminal organizations have their tendrils into Mexico, they have their tendrils into these local governments, and they're, they're killing Americans. And it is very clear how we can stop them, and, and the lack of leadership from both these last two administrations means that we're not doing it, first of all. And, and, and second of all, the other threat, I totally agree, both China and Russia are extremely involved in the politics of Central and South America. I was saying earlier, I was, you know, I was with the president of Colombia, with some friends who were very close to him, the former president of Colombia, El Duque, and, and, the, and the people they caught coming across their border, involved in political rallies, involved in helping the far left there, were people sponsored by Russia, sponsored by Cuba, the same people who helped shift Chile to the far left. These are, these are not just like local parties. These are, these are our adversaries realizing they can cause trouble for us and for the world and, and have crony governments that they can work with if they push these places to the far left. And we've lost confidence in ourselves because of former things we did in the 70s, 80s, 90s where we no longer are involved down there nearly as much as we should be. And so we have these huge threats coming from our adversaries breaking things in this part of the world. Hmm. All right, let's take these, these issues one at a time. By the way, uh, the, you can ask questions that will come up on this iPad here, but I don't know how you do that. So some way the audience can ask questions, um, and we'll, we'll get to some of those later on. Let's take these uh, issues one at a time, starting with China. General Richardson, since you were the one who first mentioned this, um, I guess, can you walk us through how China's presence is changing in Southern Command's AOR? Yeah, so um, thank you. The, uh, uh, it has definitely changed as a game changer. I think that, uh, and as I've said and I've repeated, repeatedly said in this forum, uh, actually at the Reagan Forum, uh, uh, that the uh, investment and the, through the Belt and Road Initiative in the region, 22 of our 31 countries in the hemisphere are signatories of the Belt and Road Initiative. And again, uh, I say that that's how the, they bring forward their instruments of national power, all wrapped in a tight, nice box uh, that, again, looks to be investment uh, in the region. But it's all of our critical infrastructure. 
in the hemisphere. It's deep water ports, it's 5G telecommunications, it's safe city, smart city technology, uh, AKA population surveillance technology, it's space. Why do we have the most uh, PRC space enabling infrastructure in this hemisphere out of anywhere else in the globe? Uh, and looking to uh, almost double in those space facilities uh, in the near future. And so the, when you just look at that, the encroachment on the 20 yard line in our red zone to the homeland, uh, as you talk about the Monroe Doctrine, uh, hemispheric security is really, really important. We need to be, have this uh, partnership doctrine where we are better partners and we're securing our hemisphere and shoring up and helping our, uh, helping our partner nations and helping these democracies deliver for their people. I think that's really, really what's important because each and every day, our strategic competitors are waking up, figuring out how they're going to undermine democratic institutions and democratic governments. Why, why is China doubling its space infrastructure in your AOR? I mean, what are they using it for? I think that the, uh, it's able to, um, with the, uh, the vulnerability of the partner nations of the countries in this region because of the impacts, I, th I say it's the residual impacts of COVID, uh, COVID that are still lingering. And uh, the 170 million people thrown into poverty, the 8% GDP decrease on average for countries, the high being an 18% GDP decrease for countries or for a country. Uh, they're still trying to dig out of the hole. So they're looking for how do they deliver for their people. You've got leaders, uh, presidents that are in the seat for one term of four years. They're working on a stopwatch, not a calendar. And we've got to be able to deliver at the speed of relevance for the assistance that they need from our democracies. Uh, and from our democracy here in the United States because their security uh, is our national security as well. And I would say just the instruments of national power, diplomacy, information, military, which was what I bring to the table, and then economics. Uh, we were just listening to Secretary Romano's uh, fireside chat and you know, she's talking about how national security rests on our economic security. That's absolutely correct and what I've come to realize because our leaders in the, in the hemisphere they don't see what everything that Team USA is bringing to the fight. We are not bringing it. We have all-star teammates on Team USA, but we are not bringing our instruments of national power together, synchronized as a, as a full-fledged team. We can do better at that because all the elements are there. Congressman Wallace, what do you see as the, the major threat from China in, in the hemisphere? Well, I mean, just to add a little, uh, you know, a, a little color uh, to what the general is talking about, case in point. Uh, Hurricane Dorian, uh, a few years ago, comes barreling towards our coastline. It literally does a, a miraculous halt uh, and then turn out into the Atlantic. But before it turned, it sat over the Bahamas for a devastating three days and just wiped out the northern, the, the northern islands, right? I just had the Bahamian foreign minister come see me and say, look, um, the, the Chinese ambassador there is very aggressive, is very effective. Uh, they, are, they are doing what they do in terms of taking uh, key assets, whether it's port rebuilding or what have you, in exchange for, for aid. And at the end of the day, uh, the Bahamians, because we really weren't present, we don't have an ambassador there at this point, uh, they gave up their fishing rights um, as collateral, I mean, this is 60 miles off the, the coast of the United States, as collateral for some redevelopment aid in the wake of a hurricane, the United States should have been there. That wasn't in, uh, that's in Northcom, that's not in, uh, that's not in the General's AO, AOR, but that, this is what they do over and over again, whether it's a space tracking station as collateral in Argentina, whether it's uh, ports in Brazil. I mean, I think we need a real wake-up call to the sense that 30, roughly 30 to 35% of our food in the winter flows out of South Central America and into uh, ports in Florida and, and ports in Southeastern United States. Well, if you look at how many ports the Chinese are investing into, including on both sides of the Panama Canal, which is critical obviously to global shipping and our ability to reposition our fleet. I mean, they have, have their tentacles in so many areas literally right in our own hemisphere. Um, it is, uh, I, I have your placemat of all of the investments that they have made, whether it's port processing, whether it's ports, space tracking station, electrical grids, 
Uh, but they could have a devastating effect on our economy, on our way of life, that I, I just don't think we collectively realize how interdependent we are economically, uh, whether it's energy, food, uh, or, or shipping or elsewise with, uh, with our Southern Hemisphere neighbors. General Akasoni, um, a couple of months ago, you put out a warning about some potential Chinese malware that may have infiltrated U.S. infrastructure. Does the U.S. currently have evidence that China has, has right now prepositioned malware inside U.S. critical infrastructure and why? Well, are they just waiting to use it? I mean, how big a threat is that? We did talk about this in the spring of 2023, where we said we see Chinese activities in a number of different networks, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region, where they had positioned capabilities that we did not think were solely for intelligence gathering. So the question becomes, why are you in that critical infrastructure? But I think the important piece is, what are we doing about it? And what we're doing about it is very similar to what we're doing with General Richardson, is how do we stay engaged? How do we have a, a series of partnerships? We in the hemisphere have sent two different hunt forward teams, a defend forward capability that allows us to, at the request of a foreign government, see if there are adversaries on their networks and then be able to, to ensure that those adversaries no longer able to, to stay there. That's a part of the partnering piece that I think we have to bring, not only as an all-star team, but as a, cons a consistent, persistent engagement uh, with our friends and allies in the, in the region. But beyond, I mean, do, is there now evidence that they actually have, are infiltrating U.S. critical infrastructure today, right now? Or, or is it, I mean, beyond the, the, the warning that you put out in May, are, are they physically inside U.S. infrastructure? So we have given indicators in terms of this is the type of activity that the Chinese are conducting uh, in a number of different activities throughout the world and that uh, systems administrators and those that run computer organizations should be very cautious about. And you're confident that the U.S., whether it's the government or private industry, is able to uh, detect that before it could potentially be. A we do, and, and I think that's one of the one of the really good news stories that we've been able to do is how do you work with a series of partners, both public and private, to be able to say this is what our adversaries are doing, and we should be very worried about it, and not in necessarily, you know, classified channels, but how do we talk about this, you know, to the world? Joe, how can private industry work with the U.S. government on this problem? Well, are, they, are they doing enough? I mean, is, is, yeah, is, is there this, enough this, coordination? This, 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 is, this has been, this has been a, I think, a positive trend over the last several years where it used to be that the companies that would run the cyber infrastructure for the most advanced technology companies, most advanced banks and others would have almost no role in the U.S. government and they'd be entirely different companies that were winning all the contracts from the U.S. government. And it's kind of like... It, you know, you, you know, it's like the animals that would evolve on like the Galapagos Island. If you put them on the mainland, they would be slaughtered because, they, you know, th so that's kind of how the government technology was for a long time. And, and fortunately, in the last few years, you are starting. And, and you know, I, I, that, that's a little too glib. If you go back to the 1970s, 1980s, the NSA was way ahead of private industry, by the way. I mean, I, I grew up in an era where in computer science, where the NSA would do something and then, and then the academics would figure out like 20 years later why they were doing it. And so, so there were, I think, I think if you go to the mid-century, there was the very best and brightest technology there. And I think what, what happened, uh, perhaps really the big shift was in the 90s, is you had so many trillions of wealth being created and so many new advances in technology that a lot of these things in the private world in certain areas did get to be way, way ahead, like much more so than they ever were in the past from, 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 from our perspective. And, and, and I think it took a while for the culture in the government to realize that and to say, oh, wait a second, there is some stuff out there that these giant corporations are, are doing with people in Silicon Valley that is more advanced than us. And I, and I think you've seen that realization in some areas and you have, to have, you have seen them start to adopt more private things, which is a positive trend. Hmm. Congressman Waltz, do you think that the, the U.S. is doing enough to protect critical infrastructure from cyber attacks? I think they're doing all they can from a defensive standpoint. I think the question to ask is, do we need to move to a more of a, a deterrence model? An offensive um, model? An offensive model and a deterrence model, much like the evolution that we had in, in nuclear warfare in the 1950s and 60s. I mean, if we know that uh, the Chinese Communist Party are putting capabilities in our rail systems, in our ports, in our nuclear, um, in, in our nuclear infrastructure and otherwise, not to collect information, but to essentially damage that infrastructure and therefore our economy, our way of life. Uh, do we think about that differently? Is there, is there, from a doctrinal standpoint, is there much different than putting a missile into that infrastructure or causing it to implode 
through cyber means. Either way, it's destroyed or incapable. So have we communicated from as a policy matter to the Chinese Communist Party that we can and will do this as well and take a mutually assured destruction approach? Um, because, you know, the old kind of do we start flicking the lights in Beijing yeah. and send a very strong signal on our offensive capabilities to therefore, I mean, we're having that same conversation in space yeah. in that new fighting dom domain as well. I personally believe, and the general knows far more than I do, that we can only play so much defense, hmm. right? I mean, we can't bat a thousand and uh, that we have to really look at some paradigm shifts on, on making them understand that this would this would be mutually assured destruction if they went down that road as a preventative measure to hopefully prevent them from doing that. General Nakasone, you've, you've sort of overseen the, uh, what has been a shift in from more defensive to some offensive cyber operations, or at least acknowledging that the U.S. is conducting them over the last five or six years, now five years. Do, can you give us any sense of how much of your cyber operations are offensive versus defensive right now? Yeah, so I think it's, it's better to think about it in the, the, th uh, the thought process of an entire persistent engagement spectrum. So everything you can do from defense to effects-based operations is something that we can do today. And I'm very confident in terms of not only being able to see the threat, but also being able to react to the threat, but also our adversaries knowing that we have incredible capabilities that, uh, you know, if the president determines uh, that's necessary, that we would be able to utilize them. So that whole perspective in terms of having a full spectrum operation is something we need to do. But the other thing, is, is that, and I think Joe touches on this very well, it's with a series of partners. This is the interesting part of the domain where 95% of our critical infrastructure is with the private sector. Being able to operate with the private sector, that's what we can do, and this is what we've shown over the past several years. One piece of critical but infrastructure. Courtney, on, but oh, yeah, Courtney on that, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the Russians and the Chinese have unleashed their, and I put in air quotes, private sector, often offensively. Yeah. I mean, our companies are coming to us and saying we are under a deluge, a tsunami of ransomware attacks. And so, but yet that offensive capability on our end is reserved in the government space, heck, is reserved in the Title X space. And so back to kind of Joe's analogy of the Galapagos, do we have, you know, if we unleash Silicon Valley forward, or they believed that we could, um, I mean, that is a very different conversation with all kinds of ramifications. I get that. But that's, that's kind of where from a from an oversight and a policy standpoint on the Intel Committee, those are the questions I'm asking. In nuclear sure, mutually assured destruction, it was very clear what each side could do to each other. Yeah. I don't know that our adversaries believe that we have the capability and the will to unleash that should they do it to us and therefore keep the peace. And that's, I think, a question we need to continue to ask of ourselves. What do you think about that idea, Joe? This idea of, the, of I guess, projecting that idea to an adversary. And can, can private industry or in, in some way be a part of that? Well, I, I mean, for, first of all, I 100% I, I agree. You need, to be, you need to be standing up to them and calling them out. China, from their point of view, is in a Cold War. I mean, you had Chinese and Russian troops marching with the Mexican troop parades, you know, off, right, I live in Texas, right, right nearby our border recently. You have China, you know, putting in the Huawei networks and spying on all these countries. You have them buying up the ports. You have them influencing elections to try to push in socialist governments that they could be friends with and control. You know, when, when, what we saw this last month with Iran is that when Israel was very clear with the backing of the U.S. that, you know, if they were attacked from the north, they would, they would consider an attack not, not, not from our friends in Hezbollah and Lebanon, but from actually Iran itself. And, 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 they, and, they, and they deterred them because the Iranian mullahs did not want to be assassinated. You know, and, and, and I think you have to be very, very clear with China that if, you, this, if certain things happen that you're doing right now in Central America and it's hitting us, or if, if you're supplying these things that are coming into the U.S., there's going to be an aggressive response in return. And until we have the leadership to say we're going to actually call you out and respond, they're going to keep hitting us through their proxies and they're going to keep doing what they're doing. Um, Joe mentioned the, the sort of the cyber attacks and the impact on democracy. That's something that you see in the Southcom area quite a bit, General Richardson. Can you talk to us about who is behind some of the cyber attacks and what the goals seem to be in your in your area? Well, it's our uh, it's our strategic competitors that are trying to replace us uh, in the hemisphere and uh, and be there. 
uh, for our partners, act like they're being there for our partners when they probably caused the, uh, the situation to begin with. And so what we're doing on the Southcom side of the house and the Department of Defense is help our partner nation militaries and their public security forces with cyber operations centers, with updated equipment, with the training and things like that that, that help them bring up their level of uh, being able to protect uh, their networks. But as the, our strategic competitors are attacking their networks with the ransomware, the, uh, the hacktivist attacks, very, very severe and on all of their uh, networks. I mean, you're talking the financial institutions, the healthcare. I mean, nothing is being spared. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very sporadic. It's with a lot of our countries. And so uh, cyber and being able, to, um, being able to protect themselves and their, and their governments, I mean, we're really talking about sovereignty. Countries are very, very proud and very, very strong on their sovereignty for their nations. But the cyber is a whole different ball game because there aren't alarm bells that go off in some cases until that uh, your data has been, uh, has been uh, snatched and then you're trying to, uh, you know, you're being, it's like a kidnap for ransom, right? And you're having to pay some kind of a fee or whatever. And the billions of dollars in fees that are having to be paid right now, um, I'll just refer back to the uh, 60 Minutes interview with our FBI Director Ray and the Five Eye Intelligence Chiefs all coming together about a month ago doing an unprecedented interview, talking about the importance of what the People's Republic of China is doing, stealing data, it's the number one uh, global espionage threat to democracy that democracy has ever faced in our entire history. If you have not watched it, I recommend you watch that 10 or 15 minute interview uh, talking about our data, talking about how companies, our, our U.S. companies, and uh, might not be interested in geopolitical uh, activities, but geopolitical uh, entities are interested in you. And uh, in order to protect our national security, we have got to work as a team and we have got to uh, put national security at the forefront because our data is being stolen. You know, I, I normally would never recommend watching anything but NBC News, but actually I agree the 60 Minutes spot was pretty good. Joe, did when, you want to yeah, add when we, were, when we were at PayPal early on, this is, this is like 20, 21 years ago before it sold to eBay, and the Chinese and Russian mafia literally then uh, and, the, and these weren't necessarily state actors. These were independent actors that were kind of sanctioned by the state. They were stealing like tens of millions of dollars a year from us, hundreds of millions of dollars a year from the sector. They made a bunch of our competitors go bankrupt. And this was a very profitable thing in those countries. And, and, and when we found people stealing from us in the U.S., you'd work with either the Secret Service or the FBI, the two branches in charge of that, and you'd arrest them and you'd take care of it. When we found them there and we report to the governments, it was, it was very clear they were being protected by their governments. And what was very frustrating to me is that, is that you'd have very clear criminals based in those countries, caught red-handed stealing from us, clear evidence, and our government would do nothing from a foreign policy perspective perspective to say, by the way, like, stop stealing from us, stop doing this, we're going to sanction you, we're going to punish you, we're going to do something to hurt your country for doing this. And, and that still seems to be the case today, that, that when our countries are stolen from by these actors in those countries, which by the way, at this point we have lots of evidence that China has actually been creating groups of hackers and helping them do this. So it's like semi-state sanction these days, and we'll find evidence, and, they're, and, they're, and we, yet we still have these like trade agreements with China, and there's no punishment of China, and it's very confusing to me why we, why we lack leadership from the top of our country to like hit them back. And, and, and deter these activities. It just, it just, we just lack that leadership. Do you think? Why do you think that is? We what? got, we got a promise in 2013 from Xi that he would stop. I couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, well, so if well, I might, I, I think that it's also we, we should talk a little bit about what has changed over the past five years. This idea of persistent engagement. How do we persistently engage with our adversaries? Not episodic, not when we think we need to, to strike them hard, but every single day. And this is where we need to enable and act our partners. So it's the FBI, it's Secret Service, it's the State Department. It's being able to bring these different levers of our government to bear. As I mentioned, working with General Richardson, being able to deploy teams when a foreign country asks, hey, we need some assistance. You know, being there matters. And showing up with a team from Cybercom to say, we're here to help you, is the way that we do business today. And I think that it's also the ability to, to share information rapidly, right? It's being able to tell the private sector that, hey, there are the vulnerabilities right here. This is a much more nuanced approach that we have to take to a very difficult problem. This isn't always a nation state. It could be non-nation state actors. It could be hacktivists. It could be a number of different proxies. We need a very sophisticated strategy, which we're operating now, to be able to campaign against them at all times. 
General Nakasani, we're, uh, another critical infrastructure piece that we haven't talked about is the elections. We're at T minus 11-ish months away from the Correct. presidential election. You may still be in the job at that point. I don't know. Senator Toberville's not here, so we're not sure if you're going to be able to retire or not. But um, have you seen any attempts against um, to influence the 2024 elections yet? And are you able to say whether the U.S. is engaged in any offensive operations already to preempt them? Yeah, here's what I can say. We, we haven't seen any of the attempts at, to answer your question first off, but we're not waiting. We've already at Cybercom and the NSA put together our election security group, which is our fourth election going back to 2018. And our, our strategy hasn't changed. We're going to gather intelligence, we're going to share information, and we're going to take action. And in terms of taking action, that means everything from being able to provide you know, unclassified reports of what our adversaries are doing to be able to work with a series of partners to uh, be able to take down infrastructure that might be uh, harmful to our democratic process. I'm very confident as we operate part of a broader government team operating outside the United States that will have impact again. Um, I want to go to the, another thing that was brought up as one of the biggest threats to the hemisphere, and that's drugs, the flow of drugs from across the southern border. Uh, Congressman Waltz, can you say why do you see, you explained a little bit about the beginning, but can you expand a little bit about why you see this as more of a military issue? Because I think if you're making the comparison between a Mexican cartel and ISIS, yeah. many Americans would say, well, you know, ISIS goes across the border and, and attacks people. It, it, they may not necessarily see that as, as a, a fair comparison. So why do you see it that way? Well, because they're essentially, these groups are operating in a paramilitary fashion. I mean, as, as I mentioned, they have armored vehicles, they have heavy machine guns, they're able to fight a neighboring military to a standstill, shoot down their aircraft. Uh, in, in 2019, when the Mexican army went in to arrest uh, uh, the, the son in, in the Sinaloa cartel, a battalion's worth, I mean, 800 to 1,000 uh, cartel fighters surrounded the Mexican military, fought them to a standstill and forced them to retreat. So I, I, we have to be careful with these, with these distinctions. I remember us running around the world in the 90s trying to arrest al-Qaeda as a transnational criminal group. Uh, and it took 9-11 for us to think about it differently. And the FBI at the time said, well, we didn't have enough evidence to hold up in U.S. court. Therefore, we didn't arrest some of the key leaders in Sudan and Somalia and, and elsewhere when a few years later, we're taking them off the battlefield. So uh, I, I do think uh, that our law enforcement entities are overwhelmed. They need supporting assets uh, like what General Nakasone and Cybercom could provide. Uh, we could have surveillance assets that could begin, whether you're disrupting their financial flows, you're disrupting their supply chains. If their leadership is worried about where they're sleeping at night, then they have a harder time uh, uh, moving against both our neighbor and us. And look, uh, of course we have to have the cooperation of the Mexican government. We didn't initially have the cooperation of the Colombian government when we launched Plan Colombia, when we made it clear that we're going to start moving unilaterally, we'd rather move with you than without you. That relationship changed. Heck. AMLO refused uh, uh, just a few years ago to deploy his National Guard, but after some, some, some tough engagement, uh, he had 25,000 of his National Guard's men and women on his southern border. And then finally, look, I think there's things in the non-military space we can and should be doing. If we're talking about bringing supply chains home, or at least getting them out of our number one peer competitor under the grips of China, uh, of course, I'd prefer them to be in the United States, but let's start incentivizing foreign investment into Central and South America through different types of incentive programs. But when the only solution to get at the root causes is to spend $4 billion when we know that between corrupt governments and the cartels, they take anywhere to 30 to 40% off the top, do the math, mm -hmm. you're actually fueling financially through our foreign aid packages often the very thing that we're trying to fight against. So I think there's a lot of things we could do, and I give General Richardson a lot of credit. Her and her team do so much with so little. Uh, we are constantly fighting for her place within, and, and, and that's not as much of a dig on the Defense Department as it sounds. I mean, they're stretched all over the world. But I do think we need to make Southcom much more of a priority. And then final piece, 
Look, it's not just our 2,000 mile southern border. We have a 95,000 mile coastline. And currently, of the things that we see on radar coming by air or by sea towards our coastline, we only have the assets to intercept 10% of them. That's 90% left unchecked uh, coming into across the Caribbean or uh, southeastern United States or into California's southern coast. So it is, uh, you know, right now I think there's some policy changes, but there's also just a total dearth of resources that we should rethink. Do you think there's an appetite for an AUMF right now for that? Uh, well, you know, there's, you know, flattery uh, or, or what is it? Um, uh, I don't know, imitation is the best form of yeah. flattery. I can tell you when we see the presidential candidates, at least on my side of the aisle, saying uh, that that would be first and foremost in their new administration, then I think so. General Richardson, um, Congressman Wall said that you, you have, don't always have all the resources you need. I think you have about 2% of the total DOD ISR goes to Southcom, it covers about 17% of your needs, I believe. Is that roughly accurate? Right. So. I mean, what do you think about this idea of about potentially using the military um, in this manner along the southern border? Do you see it as, could it potentially be helpful to use the military against, I know it's a policy question, but, but from a security perspective. Military resources. Military resources. I just don't want anyone to think right. I'm sending the 82nd Airborne into, well, not an not, invasion of Mexico. It it, make, it makes for a good click headline, yeah. but that is not what we're at. Well, let me ask it this way. What about <laughs> using the military for more training? For drug interdiction in South America, do any of the allies ask for that? Do you think that could be valuable in this? In this, I think that the 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 training that we already do, the security cooperation training that we do with our military partners and our public security forces, because a, a few of the countries don't have military forces, um, that all goes to their the professionalization of their force and their ability to counter the threats. Um, we've got to be able to, to help them where they need help and meet them at the speed of need and the speed of relevance for them. I think that uh, so the, the, the training that we already provide helps with that. I would say, you know, back to your question on the ISR and the ability to see our partner nations also have the same problem of being able to see threats and domain awareness. And so uh, innovation and technology is really, really important in that perspective. And just like to put a plug out that, you know, I advertise the Southcom AOR as an innovation hub uh, for the services in our uh, Department of Defense to bring their technologies to the region. Um, gosh, we're right, my headquarters is right in Miami, Florida. Um, we can test it right there with uh, Jayat of South, my Special Operations Command South, my fourth fleet. Uh, and we've been doing that actually uh, uh, very successfully. So I, I, I put that out there because domain awareness, being able to see threats and go after the threats uh, to get after the malign activity obviously is, is extremely important. I wanna put this to both General Nakasone and to Joe. How can each of you respectively uh, see <clears throat> helping fill those gaps, those surveillance gaps that might support Southcom? Sure, so you know, Andrew, one of his very first products that came out with was uh, perimeter security. And you know, it, it used to be, it still is in some places, that the way they see if someone's come across the border is you drive a pickup truck, this is not Andrew's solution, this is the previous solution, you drive a pickup truck with a metal grate, I'm not kidding, and you drive it and you smooth out the dirt and then you go look for footprints later to see if anyone crossed it. Like this is the state of the art that we are still using and that they've been using. And you know, it, it's become pretty clear to me that, so, so the Andrew solution, by the way, is you put up towers that are very cheap, they're commodity cell phone towers, you put radar and LIDAR and you use AI and cameras and you can watch within several miles of the border on either side and you can get real-time alerts and you can see the whole border. And, and we've done this now for a large percentage of the border. For some reason, we have not done it for the full percentage of the border. And it's become very clear to me, this is not really a technology problem. It's, not, it's, it's really just a leadership problem. Do the people who run this country want to secure our border? Do they want to see everything going on there? Yes. Or, or do they want there to be illegal immigration for whatever political reason they're allowing it? And, and, do, they, and do, do we want to stop the 100,000 fentanyl deaths each year? Or do we want to allow that because it's part of our immigration strategy of one of the parties in charge? Like That clearly is what's going on because it's very easy to see what's going on at the border with the best technology and we're not doing it. What, but, but, but why? What, what's stopping the U.S. from adopting that technology? Because then we would, ha th because if we literally adopted and saw everything going on and, and secured it, then you would cut off the illegal immigration. And there's, and there's a lot of politicians in this country <clears throat> who do not want to cut off the illegal immigration. 
Like, as I, so it, it's, it's a political choice, not a policy choice. We, we pretend it's a, it's, a, it's a technology thing, we pretend it's a capability thing, but it's not. It's very cheap, it's very easy to see exactly what's going on on the whole border. It's, 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 not, it's not expensive at all relative to our spend, it's a tiny percentage of the spend. And right now, let's be honest, we, we, we you know there's evidence, there's a ton of our border guards and border patrol being bribed, the cartels. It's a, I think it's a crisis, I think it's terrible. As a Texan in, in Texas, we're, we're, we're furious about this. We put up blockades and they, and they come in and they, and, they, and they cut the blockades to let the immigrants in. So I mean, it's, it's a very clearly a, a political choice being made to allow these people into our country. General Akasoni, is there more that can be done in the surveillance? Number one thing I would tell you, Courtney, reauthorize 702. It is the most important um, ability and authority we utilize in the intelligence community to be able to provide the type of insights that General Richardson needs, what our policymakers need, what we need to prevent the, you know, the, the flow of Chinese precursors into the United States and fentanyl. These are all things that 702 has allowed us to do. And at the same time, it's an authority that protects the civil liberties and privacy of Americans. And I, I, I cannot emphasize that more. It, it is an incredibly important authority we need to reauthorize. But it keeps, every time it comes up, there's this fight. And it, it, it feels like it always goes down to the wire because there is clearly a concern that it's, it is a violation of civil liberties. And I, I know there's that stat that you've given in the past that 99% of it is legitimately used. But, but the reality is because it's not transparent to the American people, they don't know that. So why, I mean, can, can you make the case here for why it is a fair, it's, it's used fairly and not violating people in this audience's? Well, well I, I would go back guys, to the Presidential Intelligence Advisory Board that said it's the most transparent surveillance authority that any nation has ever deployed. Secondly, I would tell you that there is a series of checks and balances, particularly oversight on those of us that use it, from the judicial, the executive, uh, and the legislative branches. And so we are uh, obviously addressing this, and we have to continue to make that case, and I, I certainly appreciate the, the support of others that have been doing that as well. I want to do one more to you, Congressman Waltz, about the border issue, and who, the, the migrants who are coming across, who are they and where are they coming from? Well, I, I know look, it's a big question. Right, what we, the data that we have, and this has been an ongoing fight between Congress and, and, and DHS to actually get the data, where are all of these people being sent? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we, we have the highly publicized cases of Governor Abbott sending them to Chicago and sending them to New York, and now both mayors with a fraction of what Joe Lonsdale and his fellow Texans are seeing have declared citywide emergencies. Like Mayor Adams said this is gonna be the destruction of New York with, um, you know, with tens of thousands of migrants versus the millions that have come across. So we don't fully know where everyone is going. We do know that uh, the FBI director is ringing the alarm bells that he is chasing nearly 200 cases off of the terrorist watch list. That's an increase from 11 uh, just uh, in, in the previous administration and now nearly 200. They're not sure where everyone is. Uh, and I fear, I mean, God help us if we have another San Bernardino, another Pulse nightclub, or you know, God help us another 9-11. So it's not just a, a migration threat, uh, it's a counterterrorism threat. And it's just, I mean, at two million per year, one million gotaways, that's three Jacksonville, Florida's per year uh, being created somewhere. And the stress on our overtaxed school, um, uh, hospital, infrastructure, and other systems. When I talk to a veteran who says, I can't get what I need, um, or I talk to an immigrant who came here uh, legally waited in line and, and, and followed the system, uh, that's incredibly upsetting when you see others. And heck, I mean, just to broaden it, when we look at the withdrawal from Afghanistan, when you have various groups, unfortunately, having to advise Afghans to take the migrant, the humanitarian visa from Brazil, and then migrate through our southern border to get to the United States, to get away from the Taliban, that is a broken, broken system. Um, and, you know, finally, I would say we have to solve the border issue before we can solve the other issues. If you, if you granted amnesty tomorrow for the 12 million illegal immigrants, which I would not be for, just for the record, but if you did, you're going to be in the same problem five to seven years from now. So I think Joe's right. It is not a, it's a, it's a political and leadership issue, not a technology issue. Um, General Richardson, we only have a few minutes left. I, uh, you testified that 42 of the 50 most violent cities in the world are in your AOR a couple of months ago. What's the con biggest contributor to that? And, and, are, and, and, and how does that, does that have a direct impact on 
North America? I mean, does it, does aggression lead I to I think aggression? it absolutely does. And the, um, and I would chalk that up to the transnational criminal organizations uh, and that huge uh, uh, diversified portfolio. More powerful, uh, the, the $300 billion annual revenue per year. Um, we have got to get after that, but uh, quite honestly, uh, like our strategic competitors, the Pe People's Republic of China, Russia that's in the hemisphere as well, the TCOs, um, this region is very rich in resources. And they have all discovered that. And that's why the, uh, the investment through the Belt and Road Initiative, I mean, we've got uh, the 60% uh, of the world's lithium in the lithium triangle is in this region. PRC gets 75% of its lithium from this region. Gold, copper, uh, light sweet crude that was discovered off the shores of Guyana, that's the fastest growing economy projected for the next five years at 25% GDP growth. Heavy crude in Venezuela. But you have this huge uh, uh, irregular migration problem right now. And the numbers are unprecedented and they continue to grow every year. But because of this, families are on the move and it's only predicted uh, to, uh, to increase. So with the potential, I'll go to the, back to the, the resources of the region, over 50% of the soybean in the globe is from this region. Over 30% of the sugar, beef, corn is coming from this region. Mm -hmm. How do we help this region reach a potential to feed and fuel the world? About 10 years ago, there was a lot of talk about this region being able to do that. Now there's not so much talk about that. But when you talk about these resources that are there, uh, and we ask ourselves why the investment in all of the critical infrastructure by our strategic competitor, the number, uh, People's Republic of China. So why is that? Well, the resources are there. This, uh, this megaport that the PRC is building right now, north of Lima, Peru, will take off 15 days to get food. They get 36% of their food from this region. It'll take 15 days off of that transit time from 35 days down to 20. They won't have to go to Mexico or go to San Diego before they go to China. Now it'll be just a direct shot. Why is that? That's, a, 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 that's the PRC's plan, the gateway to Asia. But where, where are we coming up with the alternative solution for all of the critical infrastructure? Why are we not competing on the contracts and the tenders that these countries put out? Why is it only the PRC that's doing that? How are we mobilizing uh, uh, Team USA to come forward and to compete for these contracts? And I would say with the administration's announcement of the uh, uh, APEP, American Partnership for Economic Prosperity, where 12 Latin American leaders were brought to the White House on the, uh, on the 3rd of November. And so, uh, and uh, billions of dollars being channeled through the Inter-American Development Bank and the Developmental Finance Corporation into the hemisphere specifically for critical infrastructure is huge, it's a start. But we gotta do more, we gotta double down, and we gotta see the importance of this regional hemispheric security doctrine uh, that we need to uh, stay, put our foot on the gas and double down, and it's a call to action, so. So you mentioned Guyana, and I'm going to take a question from here so that I don't get voted worst moderator for not taking the question from the audience. Um, th someone asked about Venezuela looks like they might forcibly annex territory from neighboring country It's Guyana. Um, how would regional partners respond to this, and how would this impact U.S. interests in, in the region? I know there was the, the ICJ announcement yesterday or the day before, that, but it doesn't seem like that might have any real teeth here and might be able to stop Venezuela from this referendum. What do you think? Could this get pull the U.S. in? So I, I would say that um, uh, Guyana and the, uh, uh, what's happening now with Venezuela and as they uh, prepare to gain, uh, pop, as Maduro tries to gain popularity in, in preparation for the, ele the national elections that are coming up, uh, that it was good to see that that vote from the, uh, the international court justice system was moved up to yesterday and they uh, voted in favor of Guyana. And, uh, and so the, uh, we'll watch very closely, obviously, the Guyana and uh, the vulnerability of that nation and uh, that democratic partner is very important to the United States. 
Uh, we only have about a minute left, and I, I feel like I always, we do these events and everyone wants to like leave and hide under their seats because we talk about all the threats that are to the homeland right now. So I want to end on a, a positive note in General Knox, I'm going to put you on the spot because you're getting ready to retire, or play, I should say, you're planning to retire. The timeline is unknown. Senator Tuberville is not here. Maybe after the game today, the football game today, he'll be in a good mood and everything will start moving through. But um, I just want to ask you, you know, after nearly four decades in uniform, you've probably spent more time than just about anyone else in uniform focused on cyber issues for the United States. I have no idea if that's true, but that seems very plausible given how many years you've, you've worked on the cyber issue. Um, what do you see as a potential bright spot in, in how uh, the U.S. is moving forward in cyber and, 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 and I guess how things may be actually getting better? Well, I think, first of all, just take a look at over the past five years. What have we been able to do? We've been able to defend successfully four elections. Secondly, we have a structure now that goes from the top of our government down to our military, down to our broader inner agencies, where there are actually cyber organizations responsible for what's going on. The Office of National Cyber Director, CISA, FBI, NSA, Cyber Command. These are all in place with the roles and responsibilities that are important. Then I think, importantly, we have really good outreach, the beginning of extremely good outreach to partners, whether or not they're academic partners, uh, uh, private sector partners, or foreign partners, to be able to come together in a manner to be able to get after very, very difficult threats. It's a different environment today, and we've been able to respond to that environment. And I think that's the really positive piece that I take from it. Will you miss being in uniform when I you finally retire? I will certainly miss it. What will you miss the most? Uh, the people, no doubt. I mean, being able to serve with General Richardson for well over two decades uh, since we met each other at the Leavenworth, uh, you know, just a fantastic opportunity. Leavenworth Prison you met each other at? Did we make a little news here today? Not no, the I'm prison. just kidding. I'm just kidding. Thank you all so much. This was fascinating. And I have to say before we end that this is the first time in 10 years at Reagan that there's been a panel completely focused on the Western Hemisphere just to give you a sense of how this is an issue that is not only important right now but growing. Um, so thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. All right.